Hi, this is Ray Mossolder, and this is Tim LaHaye and Jerry V. Jenkins' John Story. Chapter 6 By the wee hours of the morning, John had begun to repent of his instruction to Polycarp to fast and pray alone, and consider to venturing out to find the lad. His own fasting and prayer had suddenly led John to a most unusual state of mind that began with a deep, mournful view of his own sin. He'd been reminded of his anger at Serenthus, and righteous though it may have been, it triggered in John emotions and intentions he thought he'd long buried with what his friend, the late Paul, referred to as the old man. And that old man didn't refer to John's age, but rather his personality and character before the Spirit of Christ took up residence in him. The more John pondered his anger and vitriol and near murderous hatred that he had felt for a fellow human, the lower he felt. It was as if God had thrust a lantern into his inner self and searched him for every weakness, frailty, and sin. John was soon at the lowest, persuaded that perhaps God was telling him he'd made a mistake, that he of all men was least equipped to write the message that so burned in him. It was as if the Spirit of God was revealing that John had forfeited the privilege because of his lack of self-control. Rather than the eagerness he had at first encountered with the setting of the sun, the departure of the church members and the quietness of the chapel, John now faced the ugliness of his own humanity and was brought to tears. Is this the enemy trying to rob me of my joy, distracting me from a grand assignment? He only wished that so, reminded of his pettiness, jealousy, pride, covetedness, John dropped him into his chair, sobs invading his throat. Do you, do you want me broken, Lord? <laughs> is that, is that it? For I see myself as an intruder in your kingdom, an interloper, a, a foreigner. Forgive my sins and grant me peace. And with that came a gentle knock on his door. Polycarp. Oh, that would be so refreshing. It is I, came the voice of Ignatius. John swept open the door. Oh, welcome guests. Please, please do come in. I can't stand to be alone in my own presence another instant. But why aren't you asleep, friend? John. You've been crying. What is it? John told him of the events that had occurred from the end of the impromptu meeting in the courtyard, all the way through to his feeling as if his very soul had been exposed to God. This is monumental, teacher. I envy the experience you and Polycarp will enjoy. But you should not be put off by the Lord's cleansing of your heart in advance of such a task. Did you not warn me of the same when you and the other apostles commissioned me to the work of God? I did, didn't I? Of course you did. This should be seen only as further confirmation that God is in this. I don't want to speak for the Lord, but that has never stopped you before. I suppose I deserve that. I was about to question your judgment, 
and praying all night, especially now that the Father has brought you through this ordeal to a place of peace. You do have peace, do you not? I do. It came with your knock. The way I heard you tell it, Master, it came with your repentance and plea for forgiveness. It's clear God has something very special in mind for you, and he wants you wholly prepared. John pointed to the chair and sat on his bed. When Ignatius sat, John said, If you're not too exhausted, perhaps you should invite Polycarp to join us. As surely he is as lonely as I was. And if God took him through what I endured, he's probably longing for company now as well. Within minutes, Ignatius had fetched the young disciple, and John was immediately struck by Polycarp's paleness. The Lord has been speaking to you too. More than I wanted to hear, frankly, but I feel more prepared for the chore than ever. Before I was merely eager to get started for my own selfish purposes. Now I believe he has corrected my thinking, put me on the right path. Ignatius appeared to have been thoughtfully taking all of this in. Allow me to posit an opinion then. I propose that you end your fast. Continue in prayer but don't run from sleep. Perhaps I'm speaking in the flesh, but it seems to me God was after your heart's attitude, and you were willing to spend the night hungry on your knees. That he has worked in both your souls should tell you that he's brought you to the place where he wants you. Polycarp smiled. That falls comfortably on my ears, Rabbi. But am I being selfish again? John said, Let us not be too introspective. Let us accept our brother's wise counsel as from the Lord. Enthusiastic as I am about our undertaking, I believe I could soundly sleep now. I know I could, Polycarp said, and I need to. Good night, gentlemen, Ignatius said as he walked out the door. John awakened at first light with such a sense of anticipation that he barely remembered sleeping and was certain he hadn't dreamed. He felt more refreshed than he'd been in a long time, but he was hungry. The plate on the floor outside his door was a godsend. As he ate it, he wished he had a quill and papyrus. It's not that he would have attempted to record this account on his own, but already it seemed God was pouring into him the thoughts and very words he wanted to communicate. As John put out his empty plate, Ignatius accosted him. Polycarp is back from the markets, are we about ready to commence? We? You and Polycarp, I mean. Yes, and as much as I know, you want to be involved, Ignatius. Have we not agreed that someone, someone we all know and love, you, in fact, must take over our duties here until the time you set sail? In fact, do you not find it providential that the Lord sent me here for what I thought was mere filling in so you could get some rest, but had no doubt ordained this very work before even putting the thought in my head to come? I do indeed. We serve a good God, John said, his eyes shining. Polycarp rushed in, laden with supplies. What? he said, 
his gaze alternating between the two men. He smiled at Ignatius. I did not know what your business is here, sir, but if you kindly move on, we have important duties. Let me help you, Ignatius said. And when Polycarp hesitated, Ignatius added, Help you arrange everything. Then I'll be on my way. Ignatius and Polycarp spread the papyrus on the desk, filled the inkwell, and arranged the quills. I will need to be able to move, to walk, to see out the window, John said. So they cleared a path for him in the tiny chamber. Polycarp situated the chair to give himself plenty of room to work while staying out of John's way. Once everything was set, the three looked at one another awkwardly. Ignatius broke the silence. I have a meeting with the deacons and deaconesses in a few moments. Lord's Day preparations. But first, may I make a request? You both have to know how difficult it is for me to remain on the periphery of this great effort. You must promise that at the end of the day, after I've been faithful in filling in for you both here, the best I know how, that you and Polycarp will tell me all you can remember. Will you do that? With John's permission, Polycarp said. Of course, John said. I covet your evaluation of each day's work. My friend, feel free to pour over the manuscript with Polycarp. Thank you, John. Thank you from my heart. And now, dear brethren, I believe the Lord would have me pray for you. Ignatius had John sit in the chair, and Polycarp kneeled beside him. He placed his hands atop their heads and lifted his eyes to heaven. A great God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, hallowed be your name. I beseech you for this day, on behalf of these two, my friend and my mentor, believing that you've called them and set them apart for an enterprise sacred and holy. You confirmed within both their hearts that this mission is of you, and you brought them through valleys of purging to make of them pure vessels for your use. I pray you would quicken John and fill him with your spirit, flooding his heart and mind and soul with what you have him record. And I pray that the result of this divine work will settle any question of the deity of your son, refuting heresies that blaspheme the truth of his identity. We offer our thanks for the privilege of having a part in this, and may we never be the same because of it. I pray in the holy and matchless name of your dear Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. And that's it. That's chapter 6. This is a great book. It's totally unlike anything that I'm aware of that uh, Tim LaHaye and Jerry B. Jenkins wrote together, but you're getting this sense, and we'll move into it now, how the book of John was written. See you soon. <laughs>